Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Darkest Hour. I'm your host, Amanda Jane. Our great big world has so much to offer us. And it's just that, great and big. And along with those stunning characteristics comes its great mystery as well. Reports from every corner of the world ring in on almost a daily basis. Reports of mysterious sightings, strange experiences, odd feelings and occurrences. Sometimes they are dismissed, sometimes they're undeniable. The reality is, they just likely aren't all-inclusive. For every report made, there's another being buried. And for every person who comes forward, there's someone else too afraid to speak about their experience. I think it's important to share the experiences available to us, to open our minds to the possibility of the unknown. Tonight, I'll share stories from all over the world, stories that simply can't be explained away with everyday logic. The kind of stories that make it a bit harder to deny that there's more out there than we know. So, let's get started, shall we? For my college screenwriting class, we were split into groups of four students each for a group project. The assignment was to select a myth or legend to base a 10 to 15 page screenplay on. My group thought it would be interesting to choose a cryptid for the project rather than a well-known historical myth or legend. Our teacher cleared us for the idea and we started brainstorming. Of course, we didn't want to do the most well-known cryptids like the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot, so we started looking up lesser known ones. One of the ones that somebody pitched was known as the Not Deer, also known as the Night Deer in some cases. According to people's stories, it looked almost exactly like a large deer, but something felt horribly off. It was only when they drove away that they realized what was specifically wrong about it. Still, even before they understood exactly what was going on, Every story mentioned the overwhelming sense of wrongness. To quote someone else's personal account, It was a deer in the way that a graveyard is a playground. You can treat it as such, I guess, but it won't feel the same. Lo and behold, after a bit of research, I found that it was located in North Carolina. Not only that, but it was just over an hour away. Just about every written or publicized story of the Not Deer supposedly took place in Boone, North Carolina, and its surrounding areas. I informed the group of what I discovered, and being as spontaneous as I am, told them that I'd be driving out to the location that very night. I figured I probably wouldn't come across anything, even though I was legitimately curious. At the very least, it was something interesting to do, and I'd be able to accurately describe the location and ambiance of the area to the main screenwriter. I wasn't able to convince the other three members of the group to go with me. They all had their legitimate reasons. And since I made the decision to go so suddenly, I understood why none of them wanted to go with me on the trip. Still, I had nothing else to do that night, and I'd been itching for more travel ever since the entire pandemic started. I filled my roommate in on everything and asked if he wanted to go with me. At first, he told me that he would just consider it, but as I was getting ready to go, he told me that he decided to tag along. One of his main reasons for doing so was that he felt like he had to go with me. I shrugged it off, not thinking much of what he said. After filling up my car with some extra gas and buying a couple of snacks for the road, I plugged Boone, North Carolina into my GPS and headed out. 
My roommate and I were pretty relaxed for the majority of the ride there. We joked around, listened to all sorts of music through the radio and CD player, and had some of whatever snacks we'd brought earlier. Eventually, we got close to Boone. That's when we started to feel like something was off. It wasn't a feeling strong enough to make us turn around, but it was worth mentioning to each other. When we got into the city, it was just about what we had imagined. Gas stations, car dealerships, dollar stores, and small cafes. All of them were closed at that time, with the time of arrival in Boone being around 9, 10 p.m. But all of them were well lit and unintimidating. My roommate told me that we should probably head back around 9.30 and that he'd let me know when that time came around. I agreed with him since I didn't want to spend too long searching for an experience. Needless to say, when we didn't come across anything by 9.30, he decided to let us keep going for another half hour. The clock in my car's dash had been broken for a while now, and I couldn't look at my phone while I was driving so I was totally reliant on him for the time. Had I known that we were going to be driving in the area past 9.30, I probably would have mentioned it and turned around sooner. Had I done that, I would have completely missed the experience we ended up having. I'm still unsure whether or not that would have been a good thing. We ended up in Tennessee by 9.50. And that's when things started to get bad. At this point... We rarely came across any other cars on the highway. We took the first exit we saw and ended up driving along more mountainous, forested roads. This meant that there were lots of tall, dark trees and almost no streetlights, twisting roads that forced you to slow down. My roommate said that he started to feel bad about the whole situation, and I agreed wholeheartedly. Still... There was nowhere to turn, so we continued going straight since that was really the only option for the time being. A few different times we got a serious sense of dread, but usually that feeling disappeared by the time we got onto the next section of the road. There were a couple of times that the both of us had started to tear up, not because we were sad or upset, but because it felt so wrong to be there like it was somewhere we weren't supposed to be. The feeling of dread was very particular, too. It wasn't feeling bad in the sense of depression or anxiety. The best way to describe it is a sense of wrongness. It seemed to come in waves, not sticking around for a long time, but not going away entirely, either. By this point... My GPS had stopped working entirely. Both my roommate's phone and my phone said they had full bars, but mine simply refused to connect to anything. Luckily, his GPS was still working fine, so he plugged in the directions for home. It continued taking us down that road for a while longer. The area started to become much more forested as we went on, and the road started to twist and turn much more than it had before. Basically, we had come across the exact area where you'd expect a monster to be. And we started to feel really, really bad. I don't think I can express the feeling well enough with words, but it was the worst we had felt so far. We knew something wasn't right. We both felt like we weren't supposed to be there, we felt like we needed to get out. Since my roommate started getting truly spooked, that put me on edge even more, since he never gets scared of anything. There wasn't much we could do about it, though. The GPS still wanted us to follow the road, so we both awaited its next directions, eager to get on the highway back home. The sense of dread still came and went with every other segment of road we crossed. Eventually, the GPS wanted us to turn. My roommate told me to turn right on that road. I knew he meant to turn right onto the road and follow it straight ahead, but for some reason, I figured we should just turn around 
and backtrack. I started slowing down, and we both started to feel seriously bad. Like things were very wrong and something was about to happen bad. It was the worst we had felt along the entire trip so far. My roommate said my eyes were glazed over as I kept saying something along the lines of, I just need to turn around right here. I just need to turn around right here. Over and over. The more I said it, the quieter I got. Until I was almost at a whisper. Keep in mind that I am normally a fairly loud person. And I had been loud the entire drive up until this point. I pulled off onto a gravel dip on the side of the road. Along the gravel dip was a thin chicken wire fence, shiny and silver. Back on the road behind us was a wall of dirt and rock. We were surrounded by tall, dark trees that blocked most of the night sky. Even with the headlights on, it was difficult to see very far ahead. My roommate said very forcefully that we couldn't stop and that we needed to keep going because he felt seriously bad but I wasn't listening to him I wasn't quite processing what he was saying and for some reason I was having a difficult time hearing him at all after he realized he wasn't getting through to me he broke into a literal shout and told me that we had to get out of there because we could not stop and we could not go back that way. It took him using his road rage yell to snap me out of it and get me to speed down the road. The only word I can use to describe what I felt in that moment was absolute terror. Even as I was slowing down, I felt it get worse and worse until it was almost overwhelming. I only realized that after we'd gotten out of the area and back onto the highway. As we passed through the area and started getting into the city again, the looming sense of dread started to fade away. By the time we got back onto the main highway, we felt safe again. But in the moment that I pulled off onto the gravel dip on the road, where I had almost stopped the car entirely, that was the most terrifying experience I've ever had in my life. I would bet my life savings that had we turned around, we would have seen something we never wanted to. Both of us admitted to tearing up as we drove off from the spot. I was much more shaken up than my roommate was, and it took me a little while to fully process what had actually happened. I think it's safe to say, even though I didn't explicitly see anything for myself, I found exactly what I was looking for. I wanted to relate some paranormal experiences that have surrounded me and my family for a long time. For some context, me and my family are from a northern Mexican town named Peral. It's in the southern region of the state of Chihuahua. The paranormal experiences in my family began with the first marriage of my grandpa, in particular with one of his daughters named Rosa Maria. She graduated as a nurse and worked in a hospital near the house, named Hospital de Jesus. Sadly, she died of hepatic cirrhosis in 1968. So here is where everything begins. Since then, many people in the hospital have reported a nurse attending to them at really late hours of the night. This might sound usual for nurses, but the weird thing is that the nurse that attended to them has never been identified, not among the personnel in the hospital. So this myth about that mysterious nurse began to expand really fast. 
Two years after the death of Rosa Maria, my mother was born, and she was named exactly like her, in her honor, because my grandmother appreciated her so much. Time passed, and when my mother grew up, every time that someone in my family was hospitalized, many people in the hospital thanked my mom for her care and for replacing their medicine. Even though my mother has never worked in the hospital. In fact, she's a teacher, completely different than a nurse. I have experienced this nurse in person when I was in middle school. I was hospitalized because of typhus fever. My mom took me to the hospital, but received an urgent call later that night about my grandma, who was not feeling well. So for obvious reasons, she ended up leaving me at the hospital. Later that night, I noticed that my medicine was finished, and I called a nurse to replace it. Nobody came until 30 minutes later, when a nurse came to the room. She was quiet. She didn't say any words while she was changing the medicine. At first I felt scared because there was something weird about her. But after she got closer, I'd never felt such calmness and peace of mind. It felt just like as if my mother were there changing those medicines. When she finished, she just smiled and left. Twenty minutes later, a nurse came in with the medicine I'd requested, but she noticed that the medicine was already replaced. She asked me who changed it. After I explained everything that happened, she shot me a really cold look. She explained that all the nurses were busy up to that point, and that she came as soon as she had time. Me and my friend had gone to Waffle House around 10 p.m. There were a lot of people there. My friend kept complaining about how a dude was staring at her. But she's very striking, and I figured dude was just eye-flirting with her. Finally, I turn around to look, and a chill runs down my spine. Absolutely dead eyes. And this man is staring right past me, fixated on my best friend. I thought this was weird. I thought he would look at me since I made it very obvious when I looked at him that I was kind of pissed off. It was a real stop fucking looking at us look that I gave him. My friend is kind of panicking because she's just so creeped out. So I'm like, okay, let's check out and leave. He's to the right of the register and I looked at him almost the whole time we were checking out. At one point, I literally got right in front of my friend, like shielding her, because she was really stressed out. She doesn't get spooked easily either. So when I stood in front of her, he started leaning to the side, looking around me to stay staring at her. Because I hate when men feel entitled to make women uncomfortable. Plus, his eyes were so wrong. Just completely black and terrifying. He really had crazy eyes. And they were really wide open. He never blinked for the five minutes I was staring right back at him. We peeked at him through the window on the way out of the parking lot. And he was still staring right at my friend. Very creepy. And it just reminded me to be aware of everything around me and to always trust your own or my friend's intuitions. When we feel something is wrong, I just go ahead and assume something really is wrong and that we need to get the fuck out of there.
a few years ago, I worked as a masseuse at a spa hotel. I loved my job, and I hung out with several of my colleagues, even in my spare time. We often worked long days, and since I lived about an hour from the facility, it often happened that I would stay over at the hotel. Me and another masseuse, we can call her Hannah, sometimes shared a room. Hannah had worked at the hotel for several years and said that there were some rooms that you wanted to avoid. One evening after dinner at our favorite restaurant, we went to the front desk to check in. We would work another day and then be free for a few days. We paid and received our keys. I noticed that we were given room number 37, one of the rooms that Hannah had warned me about. Hannah and I exchanged glances, and she turned to the receptionist. Excuse me, but is there any chance we could get another room? Uh, Unfortunately not. The hotel is almost fully booked. We got the answer. Hannah and I received our receipt and took the elevator down to the first floor. Since it was getting late, we brushed our teeth and went straight to bed. I could not shake the feeling that someone was standing next to the bed, right at my bedside table. It's hard to explain, but it somehow felt like it was a middle-aged man. I pulled the quilt up to my chin and decided I was just imagining it. To calm down, I took a deep breath and adjusted. What happened later is even harder to explain. I've never experienced anything like it. A thought popped into my head, but it didn't feel like the thought came from me. You can't shut me out. A wave of shock rushed through my body. Hannah? I never had time to finish my question before Hannah answered. Yep, there is definitely someone on your side of the bed. I immediately turned on the light. The room looked just like usual. I told you I did not like this room, said Hannah, and I mumbled that I understood why. We slept restlessly that night, but no more strange thoughts popped into my head. In the afternoon of the next day, Hannah came looking for me. She told me that she had passed room 37. The room had new guests traveling with their dogs. Right at the beginning of the corridor, Hannah could hear the dogs barking. A woman's voice said, I don't understand what's wrong with them. A male voice replied, Beats me, they've never acted like this before. Hannah and I worked for a few more years at the hotel, but we never stayed in room 37 again. Whoever visited us that night, we are convinced that he was not made of flesh and blood. I had a nightmare about the house I used to live in, which brought up some unlocked memories and questions. When I was younger, there was a monster in my closet. In the middle of the night, said monster would attempt to open my closet door. Some days it was successful, and the door would creep open, while other days it wasn't so successful, and out of anger, it would bang on my closet door. It, quite frankly, terrified the hell out of me, to the point where I would sneak into my parents' room and sleep on the floor. I tried to tell my parents, but they didn't believe me and brushed it off as silly little kid fears. It wasn't until my sister played the Ouija board in the room that all hell broke loose. On the night my sister played the Ouija, my mother claims to have seen a portal open in her room. She said an unidentified face came out of the portal and let out a scream of agony. The house was never the same after that. 
There was so much paranormal activity that we went to different religions to try to cleanse that house. One of the people that we hired told my father to dig up the ghost's grave, which was in the back of our house, and burn the bones. The bones didn't burn, so he was told to throw them in the ocean at night. Later that night, my father attempted to throw the bones in the ocean, and I kid you not, the ocean did not want those freaking bones. With every step that my father took forward, the ocean seemed to step away to the point where he was so far out that I could barely make out his figure. But he managed to throw them in, and everything at home relaxed, until it didn't. We thankfully managed to move out, but my question is, why throw bones in the ocean? Someone, or something, touched my shoulder. It happened in 2017. I lived at my grandma's house. I could talk about many things that I'm unable to explain, but this was something that I can't shake off. My grandmother is kind of the only person who really cares about me. Broken family, etc. My grandpa died in 2012, and I'd lived at her place since 2014. Well, she was in the hospital. Nothing really bad, but was there for a broken bone, and she's okay now. I had really bad depression for some years, and I often felt lonely. One evening, I was making something to eat for myself, and I felt that really lonely feeling. I was sad, and I cried a little bit. I wasn't used to being alone overnight, and I was worried about my grandma. So I'm standing in the kitchen, making something to eat, when suddenly, someone, or something, touched my left shoulder from behind. I could feel the hand. It was really warm, and the strange thing was my sadness went away. I felt really loved. I had never felt so much love before in my life. I know it sounds really crazy, but I can describe this feeling as infinite love. All of my worries and sadness went away for this moment, and I only felt love and warmth. I was not afraid. I didn't feel threatened. As I said, many things happened to me that I can't explain but I never felt something like this. Has anyone else had something similar happen to them? Or does someone know what this could be? I think often about this, and I'm kind of curious what this was. Thank you for every comment or even an answer. Well, everyone, we've reached the end of the darkest hour. Thank you to those of you who allowed me to share your stories. And thank you to everyone for listening. Be sure to join me every Friday night at 11 p.m. right here on the Darkest Hour YouTube channel. And if you want to keep listening to the show and you never want it to end, be sure to hit that subscribe button. Do you have stories like these? I'd love to share them. Send them to me, Amanda, Darkest Hour, at gmail.com. And check out our subreddit, The Darkest Hour, YT. Stay spooky. <laughs>